we are going to speak about the advanced features so we all already know i will try to summarize as well a little bit of the basics so that it should not be like trying to jump for the topics so we all are very aware of the different types of echocardiography which can be used as types of m mode the 2d uh, two-dimensional method the color doppler the tissue doppler imaging the contrast the 3d the 4d and the strain and straight rate as well so we had already discussed so what do you use the echo for not only to see the cardiac valves the hemodynamics also you are trying to see the structural abnormality as well how is the thickness how is the function is the patient is having any congenital heart disease or some extra cardiac shunts as well so we had already spoken about it that it uses ultrasound and using which you are trying to visualize the moving pictures of your heart and the sound waves whichever is being sent it tends to get reflected back from the tissue or the structure of the heart which you are trying to visualize using the echocardiography so what tends to happen there are two ways in which you can visualize this one is a 1d mode and the second is a 2d mode so 1d mode which is called as the m mode is more of a one beam of ultrasound which is directed towards the heart and the 2D mode is, it's a broader picture so in which you can see the moving heart as well. And there are a lot of important things whenever you are trying to do an examination. You need to know the basic data as well of the patients. And you should be able to know the what about the, uh, you know, uh, the, is the patient is comfortable, the patient has any arrhythmias, you, if you have seen the ECG as well, it's always nice. And try to do the examination in the left lateral position. So in the basics, we had already spoken as well. So there are some standard views, which is called as the parasternal long axis view, the short axis view, then also the apical four chamber view as well. And then you also go to the two chamber view and also the three chamber view. And then you keep on going, uh, trying to use the Doppler view as well, trying to visualize the different anatomies, in fact. Once you have done, you finally also go to the subcostal view and the inferior vena cava. And finally, also the sub view. And of course, you can try to review them as well according to the, your need, what you want to do, or whatever uh, segment you want to really focus upon. So do you know, uh, can you, anyone make a guess? What is this actually? What do we see on the screen actually? Flash view of... Right, so this was the first, the first one is a parastyle long axis view, so which is called as the plax view. Uh, yeah, exactly. So there, it is in traces, so which we see over here, but it's not present everywhere actually. So it's a good uh, triggering point so you should start looking out for all those things as well and in the meantime uh, yeah you can try to take those measurements which we will be discussing very soon and this is the past uh, short axis view so what about these views so four the, view. Yes, four view. the answer is there so the first one is a apical four chamber view and as you can clearly see, the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right atrium, the right ventricle. And later on, how do you see is the apical two-chamber view. So in the apical two-chamber view, what are the two uh, segments which you try to see? What are these walls? Anyone? So in the apical two-chamber view, what are those walls which you visualize? So what you visualize is the anterior and inferior wall. So a lot of times, whenever you are, if you are suspecting the patient has had uh, any infarct as well, infarction. So you can try to go to those segments and you can try to visualize anterior wall uh, as well and of, of course the inferior wall. So what about this? What is happening over here? 
you started seeing like this and then you did something over here. So what was done? So what do you see over here is the apical three chamber. So there were two chamber view which you were seeing in the apex and you try to tilt the probe a little bit. Okay. And then you start seeing the apical three chamber. So which is the th third chamber is the aortic view, aortic valve as well. And this is finally the apical five chamber. So you are already seeing the left atrium, LA, LV, RA, RV, and then you have opened the fifth chamber. So this is what, what is called as the apical fifth chamber view with the color Doppler. So what do you notice in this one? So this is the suprasternal notch view. So suprasternal view which I was talking about. And the below one, this is definitely of a pericardial effusion patient. But in the subcostal or the other name is sub -ziphoid view. So the one of the key concepts for this view is you must be able to ask the patient to take a little bit deep inspiration, fold their legs and take a deep inspiration and try ask them to hold it actually. And when you, if someone is holding it, you can go over there and you can even visualize this as well. So what is happening in this image actually? What do you see over here? So this is, as I was telling, so this is what is called as the M mode. So M mode is literally you are, try, you are seeing a cross-sectional view of the heart in this line, wherever you have put up your line as well. Okay, and then later on, so for example, this was a patient in which uh, you could notice some there was some little slight discontinuation. So, what you did was you have put up a little bit of color Doppler in this segment. So, what do you notice? This could be a possible either a small ASD or even a PFO patent from an ovale as well. What is this type of echocardiography which is being done over here? Tissue Doppler. Yeah, right. So what do you use tissue Doppler for? Analog moment. Mitral analog moment. Yes, and other than that? Just a second, just a second. Hello? Yeah, yeah, please tell me. Mm-hmm. Okay, ha uh ha. -huh. Okay, ask him to come and wait. I'll uh, meet him after three o'clock. Okay, after half an hour. Just ask him to come and uh, wait. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is what is called as the tissue Doppler and the spectral tissue Doppler. So these are very important imaging modalities as well, other than the traditional two D. Or the 3D echoes, uh, which we all are aware, we will be seeing some more applications of this. So, what is this? What do you see in this image actually over here? So, this is what is called as a contrast echo. Okay, and so in the contrast echo is being done in the different views, different segments. So, apical view and also the short axis view, in fact. And this you can already see it over here this is what is called as the 3d imaging but the first one is of a dilated cardiomyopathy dilated cardiomyopathy there are some special echocardiographic parameters whenever you see them you will have to call them as dilated cardiomyopathy and similarly over here in the lower segment you see is called as a for the rheumatic heart disease. So what are the different parameters you're going to see for to call it as a rheumatic heart disease? We'll be discussing about it very soon. So what about this type of imaging? What do you notice in this? So this is what is called as strain imaging. When you are trying to visualize for the global hypokinesia, and this is more of a lateral wall hypokinesia. And why did you say like this? 
because what happens is you try to take those points and you try to see these points movement during the different phases of the cardiac cycle so what happens is when you try to notice for all these four of them it's not changing much over even with passage of time so that is why it is more of a global hypo hypokinesia is the first one and the second one is a lateral basal hypokinesia so what about this segment i have already put it out i have opened the box for you guys and girls of course so this is the first one is a more of a real four time 4d color so what is the other dimension why it is called as a 4d so what is the difference between 3d and 4d actually fourth dimension so normally length and breadth are the two dimensional features and the third dimension comes as height so, and after height which is the other one it's length breadth height and time so the four time is the fourth dimension over here and that's what you try to see in the different uh, segments so this one is with the 3d in fact and you try to see with time as well how is it happening and you can literally go forward and backward as well so yeah these um, echo machines can be a little bit costly but these are fascinating tools in which because a lot of times what may happen is uh, a lot of times uh, it's not like this that uh, you try to do echocardiography just as a fancy tool it has its own importance as well but a lot of times it can be catastrophic in the sense why so there are some clinical indications so only when an echocardiography is clinically indicated you should try to do a echocardiography otherwise when there are no clinical indications ideally it should not be done so because uh, wh why did i say it? it can be a uh, catastrophic to others as well when it is not clinically indicated you just say like oh look you are having a hole in your heart so that person's life is like oh what did happen over here so what is the problem like this so you should be aware of what to communicate is it clinically indicated is it right or not as well otherwise see this was a sim asymptomatic patient it just came to you and then you notice something over here so what do you notice over here can you see it so there's a big mass sitting over here so similarly over here as well and then you got another view as well but of course this is the best view so what I need to say is echocardiography, yes, it's a wonderful tool being a non-invasive modality, but you need to be careful what are you doing for, how are you doing for the different views as well. Not just say it like this, okay, this is there is some there's some hole in the heart, there's some mass in your heart as well. But you need to be able to quantify it and quantify it well because you guys are trained people, in fact. So that's why it makes a big, big difference, in fact. So what are the different uh, views which we try to use about as I was talking about? So this is the apical two chamber view in which you visualize the two segments and of course the two valves as well. This is the anterior wall and this is the inferior wall but the valves are leaflets are anterior mitral valve leaflet and this is the posterior mitral valve leaflet. Okay. And the apical four chamber view. So when you go to the LV apex and then you have put up your probe and then you try to visualize. And then you tilt it a little bit further and you start getting also a three chamber view as well. So in this slide we are trying to show what are the positions which is being used for different segments or different views actually. So the first one is showing the parasternal view. So over there, you can try to hold the probe and whenever you're trying to, you always try to see for its, uh, the pointer, which side is it pointing to? And then you keep on going round and round. But then second position is for the subcostal view and the last one is the apical probe position. And when you keep on turning it around, 
you will be in the subcostal view also you can start seeing the different segments of the heart and this is the M mode and when you have cut the inferior vena cava because a lot of times if, uh, if someone is in really in shock or hypertension as well so inferior vena cava you need to comment about its uh, collapse as well how much is the collapse how much is it happening for this so one of the other important factors for the systolic function is is the echocardiography and by seeing at that you can also give a positive predictive value that which coronary artery can possibly be blocked as well so you can see it over here clearly which segments which walls do you visualize in which views and also the associated coronary artery territory because then those are the segments in which you can say about that yes these coronary artery territories can be possibly influenced during that so this is what is the parasternal long axis view so in the parasternal long axis view what do you visualize over here is la left atrium left ventricle and this is the aorta and this is the aortic valve and also the right ventricle as well so in this you visualize the mitral valve and the aortic valve and of course the la lv as well so when later on when you so when you change the position of the probe from here to here then what do you start noticing so you will be in the parasternal short axis view so when you are in the parasternal short axis view the chambers which you see is left atrium right atrium and also the right ventricular outflow tract so this is of course part of the right ventricle but the segment which you see is the outflow tract so between the RA and RV is of course the tricuspid valve and over here is the pulmonary artery. So if you trace it a little bit in a beautiful way, you may also see the branches of the pulmonary artery as well. The left pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery as well. So what about this segment? So in the past on short axis, as I was telling you, so you have to keep at different levels, you tend to start dissecting. Literally, you are dissecting the heart in a non-invasive way. So in this segment, we start also seeing the papillary muscle. And of course, the two segments which you see is the left ventricle and also the right ventricle. You might also already be knowing, if you all will remember my ECG sessions, about the papillary muscle, in fact. So papillary muscle, VT, in fact. So you, can, you may even see in this segment, where is your papillary muscle, in fact. And now coming to the apical two chamber view. In the apical two chamber view, you see the left atrium, left ventricle, and also the mitral valve. Similarly, this is the apical four chamber view. LA, LV, RA, RV. And this is the apical long axis. So in the apical long axis, what happens is you start seeing these anterior inferior wall when you tilt it slightly, you will also be seeing the inferolateral wall, in fact. Of course, with the aortic valve. So, I had already said it about these segments. What do you visualize? So, this is more like a revision. When you take a good view, as I had already said, RVOT is there. And this is the pulmonary artery. And finally, bifurcating into the branches. Right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. And this is the aortic segment. Which segment do you visualize in this view is ascending aorta. And in this parasternal short axis view, you visualize the mitral leaflets. What are those mitral leaflets? Anterior one and the posterior one. And this is the interventricular septum. And this is the right ventricle, in fact. So this is a very beautiful view in the sense you are able to visualize all the three cusps all the three cusps in fact so it's a little bit uh, you will have to be a bit imaginative in the sense so on this side you visualize the left coronary cusps over here is the right coronary cusp and over here is the non-coronary cusp so on the left side is the left one right side is the right one and the one which is not uh, localized kind of you can call it as 
the non-coronary cusp. And over here, you do visualize a vessel, what is called as descending aorta, in fact. So we, this we had already said it. What do we visualize? Okay. This is again left parasternal long axis. So a lot of times, if there is chordae tendony rupture, so if you go to the left parasternal long axis, so in this, when you, in the systolic frame, you may also be seeing these chordae tendony as well. LALV is of course there, the non-coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp. Uh, and this is the RVOT over here. What do you see over here? Okay. So when you are trying to see the inflow tract, so you are already in the parasternal long axis, you just have to tilt a little bit. When you tilt a little bit, this is what is called as the RV inflow tract. So I think we all are very much aware of the different cardiac cycles. So there are four different phases of the cardiac cycle, especially in diastolic relaxation, which is IVRT, isovolumetric relaxation, early filling, diastasis, and the atrial contraction. So IVRT, what is IVRT actually? How do you measure that? So this is always an important question. So IVRT is measured as the time between the closure of the aortic valve and the opening of the mitral valve. So that's why, so what will happen is, that is why you start seeing during that phase, there are two peaks. One is an E and another one is a A. So what is E standing for? A standing for? So the E is actually due to the early diastolic filling, which is almost the 70 to 75 percent of the ventricle. And the A is due to the atrial contraction, which forces 20 to 25 percent of the stroke volume into the ventricle. So now, trying to uh, comment about the diastolic dysfunction. So normal, what happens is when you try are trying to comment about the diastolic dysfunction. So this is how you see the uh, if uh, you get such kind of pattern across the mitral inflow. So a lot of times, a lot of people they get confused how to differentiate between a normal one, mild diastolic dysfunction, moderate, or the severe one. Even in severe, there are two different types. First one is a reversible restrictive, and the last one is the fixed restrictive. So what do you notice over here? So of course, in the normal diastolic dysfunction, E is more than A. And they are separated. But in mild diastolic dysfunction, A is more than E. But then what do you notice over here? In a moderate diastolic dysfunction as well, this is almost similar, right? So that is why it is called a pseudo, pseudo normal function. So the question comes now is, how are you going to differentiate between the pseudo normal, which is moderate diastolic dysfunction and the normal diastolic dysfunction? So for that, you can try to do some maneuvers. So maneuvers will be is, so if you ask them to clasp their hands and you know try to take them away from each other, then you will be able to visualize that. And that's for how you try to differentiate between both of them. So then when you try to do a tissue Doppler imaging of the mitral annular motion, you can see both of them are different. Isn't it? So what will happen is the ratio of E to E prime is going to be less than 10 for the normal one. However, for the pseudo normal pattern, if it is pseudo normal pattern, you will be seeing the difference is more than 10 times, in fact. And then, of course, you can go to the pulmonary venous flow as well. And then you can try to do, and as I was telling, the LV relaxation, you can try to measure the compliance, the atrial pressure. So the uh, uh, multiple parameters. So it means is you should never depend on a single parameter whenever in doubt. Yeah, you should be able to make use of these multiple parameters in a great way and it's always helpful in fact. So the other thing, so what about, uh, yeah, pseudo normalization as I had said it, it looks like normal but uh, whenever you use, it's a common question, how do you differentiate between the pseudo normalization and the normal pattern? So the pulmonary vein 
pulse wave Doppler, it can be shown that the relaxation pattern is abnormal and the systolic blunting. So there is decrease in the height of the S wave. And as I had already said it, performance of the Valsalva maneuver. And in that, we can unmask that. Now, the other common question comes is, those A waves, which is there, normally you may not be able to see in conditions of what arrhythmia you will not be able to see those A waves. PSVT. Not in PSVT. In PSVT you will be able to see. But in atrial fibrillation. So in atrial fibrillation you will not be able to see. So what happens during atrial fibrillation? Because there are no a, a waves during atrial fibrillation, right? All you see is those fibrillatory waves. So that's the reason. So that's why, and as we all know, so you will be able to see the, uh, you will not be able to see the A. So what is going to happen is, so during that time, if you really want to comment about the diastolic dysfunction, so what are you going to use? You can use this E, E dash ratio. And a lot of times what will happen is in cases of sinus tachycardia, E and A wave may be almost fused. So what happens is in those conditions as well, you can try to use this E or E dash ratio. So which I had already shown you over here. So this is the E, e dash, how it tends to change across the different diastolic dysfunctions. Position of the cursor is important. Whenever you're trying to do an e imaging as well, for this, the position of the cursor is important. If the pulse wave sample window is incorrect, of course, you are, what you're going to get is the artifacts. So that's why, so whenever you are trying to do these kind of measurements as well, the cursor should be placed at the level of opening of the leaflets. Similarly, for example, for the presence of mitral valve abnormalities, for example, for the mitral stenosis, will alter the pressure gradients and also change the loading conditions of the left ventricle. Similarly, if the patient has aortic regurgitation, so you will see a rapid rise of LV diastolic pressure, which will be affecting the gradient across the mitral valve during diastole. Similarly, as I had already said, during atrial fibrillation, you will not be seeing the A wave. And that's why during that time you will try to see E E dash. So this is another Google slide in which we have put up the E E dash ratio in fact. And then on the basis of that, how you can classify into the norm function. Okay. And um, the grade one, grade two, grade three diastolic dysfunctions as well. So now, the one important thing is, what about those important factors which we are concerned about? So the most common impact, uh, important factor which we all are concerned about is the LB ejection fraction. So ejection fraction is said to be normal when it is more than 54. Mild LB, uh, left ventricular function, ejection fraction will be, this function is 45 to 54%. Similarly, it will be moderate when 30 to 44 percent and severe will be less than 30 percent. For the RV function is also important. So most of the times, although we do comment about the LVEF as well, but what about the right ventricular injection fraction? Uh, uh, so whenever you are trying to see for the RV diastolic area, the systolic area, the fractional area changes as well. So these are some of the parameters which you should be able to spend time. It should be really there in your mind. TAPSA. TAPSA should be there in your mind. You try to see in the terms of centimeters. So if it's less than 1, it is severe. 1 to 1.2 is moderate. 1.3 to 5 is mild. And normally is 1.5 to 2. So what had happened is, you saw initially your four chamber view, you try to see, 
then you notice something is over here. Okay, there's something is interesting is here. So what do you do? Try to put up a color doctor over there. Then you start noticing something else. You notice, oh my gosh, this is such a big jet. So then, what it is is mitral regurgitation. Similarly, this is in left vent ventricular outflow tract, but of course across the aortic valve. So this is referring to the regurgitation jet in the aortic area. So this is how you visualize in the left parasternal long axis view. And this one, so you, I think you will have already noticed it. This is how is the ventricular septal defect. And in this segment, what do you notice? Hmm? So this is clearly the atrial septal defect. And how about this segment? So the common question comes is, what about those valvular abnormalities as well? So how to differentiate for them? So how are you going to differentiate for them is, first thing is important characteristic is, what is normal? If you know the normal, you will also be able to comment about the abnormal as well. So how do you comment about that? So for example, if you know the mitral valve area normally is, how much is the normal mitral valve area? 1.8 or 2. If it is more than that, it's always normal. So but if it is, the mitral valve area is less than 1 centimeter square, it will be severe mitral stenosis. 1 to 1.5 will be called as moderate and if it is the heart uh, if if it is in the range of nearly 1.5 more than 1.5 to you know 1.6 1.7 and all then it will be called as a mild mitral stenosis and whenever you comment about the mitral stenosis of course you should be able to see about the pulmonary artery pressure and also the mean gradient as well Okay, so as I had already said it, so this is how you try to see for this and indirectly also, uh, so whenever you come across a patient with high left atrial pressure, you try to give, what kind of treatment do you give or do for those kind of patients? You try to give diuretics, beta blockers and also lower salt amount as well. And if the patient is having atrial fibrillation, of course, the rate control, rhythm control, and also the anticoagulation. So now, since we are aware of the mitral valve stenosis problem, what about the mitral valve regurgitation problem? So you try to see. So first of all, you try to quantify the mitral uh, regurgitation area. If it is less than 4 cm square or 20% of the left atrium area, it is called as mild. Okay. But if the vena contracta, the jet which I was showing you, which was there earlier, so that central MR jet area is more than 40% of the left atrium, it will be called as severe. Otherwise, it will be swirling around the the jet which goes around no it will be literally swirling so that's what is again indirect marker for severe mitral regurgitation as well so 40 percent of the left atrium area it is severe and if it is between these two values so this this is what is going to be the moderate one similarly so what are those uh, supportive uh, data for this so you will try to see for the A wave dominant and then all these parameters which you can all of course see as well. So regarding the mitral stenosis, as we all know, it's a very important thing to comment about this kind of parameter. So there is something is all so called as Wilkins score. So there are four grades in the Wilkins score. So what are those four grades? The grade one is you have to keep on commenting about there are four important parameters, four grades, four parameters, okay? All are four. So you have to comment about the mobility, 
thickening, calcification, and also the subvalvular thickening as well. So I used to remember it was MLC. Medical legal cases are there, no? So I used to call it as MLCS. So many MLCs. So MLCS. Mobility, leaflet th thickening, calcification, and also the subvalvular thickening as well. So there are so many MLCs which is happening in the Wilkins. So that's why it is called as MLCS. Mobility, leaflet thickening, calcification, and also subvalvular thickening as well. So now coming to the four grades. How do you go and comment about them? So the grade one is regarding the mobility, what do you observe is the valve is mobile, but only the tip, the tip, the you know, the tip will be restricted. And then of course you also try to see the leaflet thickening is almost like four to five millimeters. Calcification at the most is present in just a single area. The subvalvular thickening is like really minimum, minimum. There is hardly anything which you see it over there. Now coming to the grade two. In the grade two segment, what you notice is leaflet is mid and basal is normal. But when you come about the leaflet thickening, five to eight millimeter is there, so it is slightly more thickened, and also there is mid leaflet is normal. And calcifications can be present in the more areas, in the subvalvular area, when you notice that it is extending to one third of the caudal length actually. And now, what about the grade three actually? So what do you notice in the grade three? So in the grade three, what you see is the valve continues to move around in diastole, okay? In diastole, but mainly from the base. And then of course, leaflet thickening tends to increase further. And you see that thickening is present throughout the leaflet. And calcification literally goes even into the mid region as well. And so the valvular thickening is extending to the distal third of the cord. And regarding the grade four, grade four, everything is gone. In the sense, like, there is minimal forward movement of the leaflets. The leaflet thickening is quite a lot, quite a lot. And regarding the calcification, it is extensive calcification, and th which is present throughout most of the leaflet, in fact. And the subvalvular thickening, is extending even up to the level of papillary muscles. If I hope you all will remember about the segment in which we can visualize also the papillary muscles in fact. So this is a beautiful slide which is showing about different segments. How do you notice it actually? So I, right now, I would really like you all to go through these slides in a nice way, spend a lot of time how do you see it actually? How do they look like? And it will really give you a lot of practical ideas as well. So this is a very important slide as well. Uh, this is a very important slide and this is that's why it is important. What is the beauty of this slide in fact? And the beauty of this slide is, as I said it, so you are able to see the different segments, what is happening in the different times as well for the mitral valve, in fact. So during the sinus rhythm, how do they look like? But if there is a SAM, what is systolic anterior motion or the anterior mitral valve leaflet as well, how do, does it look like if you do a M mode? Similarly, for the mitral valve prolapse, how does it look like if you do a M mode? And then across the sinus rhythm, the SAM, then the atrial myxoma, Otherwise, if the patient is having vegetations, how does the M mode look like? Similarly, about the aortic regurgitation or otherwise, atrial fibrillation or also for the, if there is premature atrial closure as well. Okay. So really, I would like you guys to focus quite a lot on these two slides. So with this M mode itself, a single M mode, you are having an idea what type of heart problem the patient may be having almost actually so
So I would really like you guys to go through these slides and all. And with this advice itself, today I'm going to stop. And uh, in tomorrow's session, we'll continue with the second part and we'll be discussing about all these things in detail. Okay? Any questions so far? Otherwise, of course, you all can put up your questions and we'll try to answer them tomorrow as well. Okay? Hello, Dr. Narendra. Yeah, yeah.